I'm gonna ring the bells again. And since there's no children from where I see, uh, if anybody wants to come up and ring the bells, you guys can come up now. On the count of three, we'll ring the bells 11 times. Three, two, wait, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Max, I, I filled in for you last week and I messed up the countdown too, so it's all good. I'm glad to have you back. Friends, we're glad to have you here. Welcome to worship this morning, whether you're worshiping in person with us or watching us online. We're so glad you're here. We're so grateful to Rusty, who is here as our guest uh, music director or organist, I should say. Thank you so much for being here while uh, Marilyn is out. She is in uh, rehab um, now and is grateful to be starting uh, some physical therapy. So we're so glad for that for her. We're so grateful. We've got a beautiful special music piece with a guest, um, Heather Parton. Thank you for being here with us as well this morning. Friends, I wanted to let you know a couple of announcements. Um, one is that um, I haven't, I was just mentioning with Irene, uh, we are inviting you sometime this summer to do something wild, like switch up your Sunday morning routine. So for those in 11 o'clock, I would invite you to come one Sunday at 9.30 to our E3 service. Come see what it's about, come participate. Uh, we had prizes this morning, we had paper dolls, we had uh, special music, it was a, a real fun time. This next Sunday, if you decide to mix up your uh, routine next Sunday, July 3rd, maybe you want to get an early start on the other festivities of the weekend, uh, we will be having a communion breakfast together. So it would be a really lovely, fun time for you to come. We'll have full communion, but we'll also have breakfast with it. So as I pass around our log sign up so that you can see for our last Tuesday group, meeting this Tuesday at Ariana Cabal. Bob and Grill, uh, remind yourself or add yourself to the list. Tuesday, 11 for, uh, 1145 here at the church if you'd like to carpool, noon at the restaurant if you want to meet us there. And then for everyone else, if you want to think about um, adding your name, if you're going to kind of come visit E3 next Sunday, we've got a sign-up list started. You can bleed onto the back if you need to. You don't need to bring food. We do have sing things covered, so we'd invite you just to come, but if you'd like to bring a little something to contribute to our breakfast, we wouldn't say no. All right, so I'm gonna pass this around. We'll let that make its way through the congregation, through the pews um, as we continue in worship this morning. There's a few other announcements. On your way out, if you'd like, if you haven't already, you can grab a list of the donations that are needed for VBS, which is coming up July 25 through 29. So this handout, which will be there on that table as you exit, has all the information you need. We're so grateful for the way this congregation supports VBS. Uh, another thing to let you know, we have a, uh, a little write-up about our session meeting that you can read in your bulletin just to give you some insight into what's going on there and to remind you that you as congregation members are invited to session meetings. If you'd like to be a guest, we just ask that you give us a heads up and let our clerk of session Rose know um, so that we can prepare to have you as guests. Sometimes we might have to switch our location for our meeting in the building if we know we're gonna have a larger group. Uh, but you're welcome to that anytime. The other thing we wanted to let you know is session voted um, at our session meeting last Last week to have a child protection policy take effect um, immediately in the church and so one of the things that um, is in that policy is that we're going to have a mandatory training for those volunteers who are currently serving with children or youth in our church so right now that would be folks who might work with the youth group with children's church with VBS um, 
we're going to have a training night really to go through the content of the policy so that we're clear on our procedures and how to um, basically protect everybody. It's a win-win situation um, with the policy, um, as well as to give our volunteers time to fill out our application form, uh, because another part of the policy is that we need to conduct background checks uh, and some reference checks um, so that we, again, are doing best practices and keeping everyone safe. So Thursday, July 7th, is when we're gonna have our mandatory training. And we realize that's summertime and that might not work with everybody, so we have a makeup date scheduled for after worship on Sunday, September 11th. We'll remind you when that's coming close. But Thursday, July 7th isn't far off. This is the, what we're calling our mandatory training for those current volunteers. I would invite you um, to let us know if you're coming. Uh, so you can see there is a registration form. Really, we're trying to feed you. We figure it always helps if there's a little food involved. So we're gonna have a hoagie dinner and we wanna have enough to feed you. If you're somebody in the church who's not currently volunteering with children and youth, but you think you might be in the future, we would invite you, encourage you to attend the training. You can start the process or you can just learn about what the new process is. So those are our main announcements. Is there anything else that we would announce for the good of our community that I've neglected? I think this is it. All right. So on that note, I would invite you to take in a deep spirit-filled breath of the spirit breath of God and to release it out. And let's call one another to worship. The call to worship is printed in your bulletin and it's on the screen. Spirit is with us and in us. Spirit heals. Spirit blesses our mourning with the oil of gladness. Thanks be to God. I invite you, if you're able, to stand and join us in our opening hymn. It's number 2117 in Sing the Faith, and it's on the screen. It's Spirit of God. So will you stand now as we sing together?
Men, you may be seated. Friends, we know that this is God's world that we're living in, but it is a world that's broken by our own doing. God is continually there offering us wholeness, yet we often turn away, refusing God's love because it comes sometimes through means that we just dislike. Let us together confess our brokenness and seek to be open to God's wholeness through whatever means it comes. Will you join me in the prayer of confession? Holy God, we confess that we have sinned against you and against your whole creation. We have not loved you with our whole being. Rather, we have loved ourselves at the expense of others. We have ignored the cries of the poor. We have turned away from those in need. We have shunned those who are different from us. We have abused and exploited each other and the world you have made. You have sent prophets to convict us of our sin, yet we have rejected them. Forgive us, O God. Open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to your presence all around us. Transform us in our weakness to live with the power of the risen Christ, accepting, loving, and seeing all, and living in harmony with all you have made. Amen. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, and peace given to you through the grace of God. By the power vested in me as a minister of the church of Jesus Christ, I proclaim that you and I are forgiven. Live in the word of the Lord and be made new. I invite you to stand for our response of praise. It's hymn number 322, Spirit of the Living God. You might remember that on Pentecost, I showed you some sign language for this song. And we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it to you again and invite you, if you can pick up some of the signs, to do it along with me. Are we good with our slide or should we look up in the book? We've got it. All right. Amen. You can be seated, and the children, I'd invite you forward for a time together before you get to go to Children's Church this morning. I've got a little bit of a book, so I want you to be able to see the picture, so you can sit right here on the carpet so you can see. But the first thing I want to ask you about, something that I think is a little different from when I saw you just a week ago on Sunday last week. Has something big changed in your life since last Sunday? Does anybody know? I think I heard it whispered out in the congregation. Uh, your grandma came. I'm so glad. Hi, grandma. Is that her back there? It, no, it's not. <laughs> Hi, grandma, wherever you are. So you have your grandma visiting, which is really exciting, and that was not something last Sunday. I was thinking of something that would be the th same thing for all of you. You would have it in common. Do you think you know, Axel? Starts with a s, ends in an ool. 
school. Are you still in school right now? No. No. You're going to go into second grade. I'm going to go into fifth grade. You're going to go into fifth grade. What about you, Axel? I'm going to Andrew's school. He's going to kindergarten. You're going to go into kindergarten. Max? Sixth grade. All right, can we have a big round of applause for all of our kids here and a part of our church community who have just finished another year of school. High five, good work. We're so proud of you. One of the biggest parts of your job as a kid, right, is going to school, yeah? It's like in the church we would say, it's part of your calling from God is to go to school during the school year and to learn and grow. And we're so proud of you for the learning and growing that you've done this year. And we're so excited that now it's summer break, right? What are you looking forward to this summer? Anything, grandma? Your birthday, when's your birthday? August 15th. August 15th, that's a perfect summer birthday. What else? Yep. And it hasn't been open for two years. Oh, because of COVID. Oh, awesome. So summer fun at the pool. And I'm also looking forward to celebrating July 4th. And July 4th, oh yes, which is coming next weekend. Anything you're looking forward to, Annabelle? I'm going to my neighbor to invite me to go into their pool and Awesome. So you get to go into a friend's pool. That is so much fun. Summer is such a great time to take a break from school, to do fun things outside. What about you, Axel? Sometimes, sometimes summer going to have like bees. Sometimes there's bees, that's right. Yeah, yeah when, when, when my aunt and, and my dad and mm -hmm. me, we went to Florida and I don't want to swim anymore. Yeah. And I saw bees and I hurry up get the and the yep, you gotta hide from the bees sometimes. Yeah, yeah I know. There was a hornet last uh, yesterday outside that Micah was running away from. So I wanted to tell you about another thing that we call this time when school gets out. There's a special name for this season when we come to church. If you remember a couple weeks ago, a bunch of us wore red together. Do you remember the day when we came to church and wore red? And we kind of had a party, we had some special treats, we had some red balloons some of you got to take home. That day was called Pentecost, do you remember that? And we celebrate the gift of God's Spirit coming on all of us and helping us follow Jesus in the world. This time, right now that we're in, when school lets out, we call this, get ready, drum roll, the season after Pentecost! <laughs> we also call it ordinary time, <laughs> which I just think is kind of funny because it's like wah, wah, ordinary time. But I wanted to tell you about this ordinary time, this season after Pentecost, so you can think about it as you go about your fun summer. So here we go. We're going to read a little bit together. The season after Pentecost lasts for a long time, over half of the circle of the year. If we think about the church all year long, we put it in a circle. In church, we call it ordinary time. I'm not sure why. There are no big holidays during ordinary time. There is 4th of July, but they mean holidays like Easter and Christmas. But life in the spirit is not ordinary. Amazing things are happening. The seeds we planted in the spring are waking up, beans are popping out of the soil, flowers are blooming, and the bees are buzzing around them. In the pond close by, tadpoles are becoming frogs. Everything is growing and changing. We feed our garden with rich black earth from the compost pile. All through the winter, we collected scraps, vegetable peelings, eggshells, coffee grounds. Stirring it was my job. I never liked the wriggly worms or clouds of flies. 
But I love how the bits and pieces we throw away turn into something good, something that makes our garden grow. I wonder if even that is the spirit at work. One of my favorite parts of summer is spending a week at a cottage near the ocean. We walk on the beach, jump in the waves, and fly kites. The wind makes me feel alive. I fill my pockets with sea glass. When I get home, I make pictures with the bits of glass. I like how the sea and I both make something beautiful from broken pieces. Maybe the spirit does that too. By midsummer, our garden is full of good things, almost too full. There is more than we can use, so we share with our neighbors. We bring baskets of carrots and beans to our community food bank. We make casseroles and freeze them. If someone needs a meal, we are ready. It feels good to know that the seeds we planted are bearing fruit. Bees and butterflies visit our garden. There's the bees. We choose plants they love. Black-eyed Susan, Echinacea, Bee Balm. Without these tiny creatures to pollinate our trees and plants, we'd have no flowers or fruit. Imagine a world without blueberry pie. We need them, they need us, we're all connected. We planted milkweed for the monarch butterflies. These tiny travelers have a long journey south. Our garden is a safe place where they can rest, lay their eggs, and feed their families. Butterflies are not the only ones that migrate. People do too. Some choose to move. Others have no choice. I try to imagine what it would be like to have to move. What would I carry with me? What would I leave behind? What would I miss the most? I hope someone would make a safe place for me. One hot day, my friends and I sell homemade lemonade. All the money we earn, we give away to help families looking for safe places to live. We're far away, but we can still help. We need each other to do the work of Jesus. The Spirit connects us all. At our church camp, we make care packages for people who live on the street or in shelters. We decorate paper bags and fill them with toothbrushes and toothpaste, soap, shampoo, and socks. At night, as I brush my teeth, I notice the clean water, my new toothbrush, the lemony smell of the soap. When I pay attention, I notice more. The more I notice, the more grateful I am. Maybe the Spirit is waking me up. Maybe I am growing the fruits of kindness. My prayer for you and for all of us is that in this season after Pentecost, sometimes called ordinary time, that we would grow in kindness. You don't have to worry about going to school right now, but maybe we can ask God's Spirit to keep teaching us things, things about kindness and caring for everyone. Can we pray that prayer for us and for all of us during this summer? Will you repeat after me? Dear God, thank you that school's out. Help us to have a good summer. Keep us safe, keep us healthy, help us to have lots of fun. Help us to grow in kindness. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, friends. Enjoy Children's Church this morning if you'd like to go. And I'd like to invite Heather to come now for our special song this morning.
Amen. Thank you so very much, both of you. Friends, I invite you to join me in prayer. God of grace and passion, you sent the promised gift of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and the women, upon Mary, the mother of Jesus, and upon his brothers. Fill now your church with power. Kindle flaming hearts within us and cause us to proclaim your mighty works in every tongue, that all may call upon you. We pray this in the name and the spirit of the risen Christ. Amen. Our scripture this morning, it comes from Numbers, the book of Numbers. Yes, that is one of the books of the Bible. Chapter 27, verses 1 through 11. The daughters of Zelophehad, 
Hefer's son, Gilead's grandson, Machir's great-grandson, and Manasseh's great-great-grandson, belonging to the clan of Manasseh, son of Joseph, came forward. His daughter's names were Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirzah. They stood before Moses, Eleazar the priest, the chiefs, and the entire community at the entrance of the meeting tent and said, our father died in the desert. He wasn't part of the community who gathered against the Lord with Korah's community. He died for his own sin, but he had no sons. Why should our father's name be taken away from his clan because he didn't have a son? Give us property among our father's brothers. Moses brought their case before the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Zelophehad's daughters are right in what they are saying. By all means, give them property as an inheritance among their father's brothers. Hand over their father's inheritance to them. Speak to the Israelites and say, if a man dies and doesn't have a son, you must hand his inheritance over to his daughters. If he doesn't have a daughter, you will give his inheritance to his brothers. If he doesn't have any brothers, you should give his inheritance to his father's brothers. If his father has no brothers, you should give his inheritance to his nearest, nearest relative from his clan. He will take possession of us. This will be a regulation and a case law for the Israelites, as the Lord commanded Moses. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some of you might recall the iconic opening number from the 1964 Broadway musical, Fiddler on the Roof. I'm giving you a minute to think about that. Tevya, the milkman, begins to sing a rousing song about how the villagers in the town of Anatevka are trying to continue their traditions and keep their society running as the world around them changes. How do we keep our balance? That I can tell you in one word. Tradition, right? I wanted to play the music for you, but you know, live streaming and copyright couldn't do it. Throughout the musical, we watch as Tevya attempts to maintain his Jewish religious and cultural traditions as the outside influences are encroaching upon his family. He must cope with the strong-willed actions of his three older daughters who wish to marry for love. Their choices of husbands are successively less palatable to poor Tevya. Does anybody remember the names of Tevya's five daughters? Zidal, Hadl, Chava, Shespritza, and Bielka. And E3, Nancy remembered Bielka because her daughter got to play that part. The faces of our faith series, this summer series that we're doing in both E3 and this 11 o'clock service. Today we are featuring another drum roll moment, some of the most important women in the biblical canon. If you know them at all, you know them as the daughters of Zelophehad. Like Tevye's five daughters, they are the five daughters of Zelophehad. And if you had trouble recalling even some of the names of Tevya's daughters in Fiddler on the Roof, I sense that you were having trouble perhaps naming these five daughters. We worked on it really hard in E3. Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tirza. 
Now there's a perfectly good explanation for why you may not even know who I'm talking about, much less be able to name the five names. Out of all the many biblical texts that show up in our church's three-year lectionary cycle, their story doesn't come up once. Yet the story of Mala and Noah and Hagla and Milka and Tirsa is so important to God's story that they're mentioned in no fewer than five different scriptural texts. They show up in Numbers 26. They show up in Numbers 27. They show up in Numbers 36. They show up in Joshua 17. And they show up in 1 Chronicles 7. In four of those five places, the recitation of their five names is included. And given the paucity of women's names in scripture, that's really extraordinary. In fact, only the prophets Miriam and Moses are mentioned more in the Old Testament than these daughters. And if you think about them showing up in five different places, well, that's one more than the four canonical gospels. Now, the first time these women are mentioned, it wasn't in the text that I read for you. It's mentioned in, in Numbers 26, and that's when we learn that they're in this genealogy of their clan. You see, in Numbers 26, God's telling Moses, who's in the process of taking a census of all those Israelites who are wandering together for 40 years in the wilderness, to use the census to apportion land according to the number of names in the census and according to the paternal tribe affiliation. So you see, the way things were was that the land was only given to patriarchal households, those headed by a male. Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tirza, they were specifically excluded from the census. They're listed in their clan, but they're excluded from the census because they were manless. Their father was dead and they were unmarried and they had no brothers. What's so striking, I think, about this story is that at every moment, the text is told in a way to bring into sharp focus the agency of these five women. The first thing, the first word coming in the Hebrew text in the story as it opens in Numbers 27, it says, they came near. And then the next thing in the Hebrew text is a list of all their five names. And then it says, and they stood. And so there's this deep drama in the telling of the story. And then we think, well, where did they come and stand? Well, symbolically, they came and they stood before God. And that's symbolized by the tent of meeting that they come into. But they're also standing before all the leading men of their community, Moses and Eleazar. But then all the people are there as well. They're all gathered because it's census time and land is getting apportioned out. So they come at this really critical moment. Lots of pressure, lots of drama. Their timing is not, it is hardly coincidental. The assembly has yet to close. Land is being apportioned and they come forward. Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tirza, they come forward, and get this, they don't ask, rather they tell Moses, give us the land. Their request is written in a command form, give us a possession among our father's brothers. Moses seems a bit caught off guard unable to render a just judgment in this case, and so, to his credit, he appeals to God. He doesn't simply dismiss them out of hand. What comes next should give us pause. 
God's vindication of Mala and Noah and Hagla and Milka and Tirza is given by God in the strongest terms possible. The daughters of Zelophehad are right in their speaking. God pronounced that they were correct, honest, righteous in what they requested. It's a really powerful affirmation. It's unique the way it's written in scripture for either women or men to be so commended by God in their speaking. But then it goes a step further. God reveals a new law for Mala and Noah and Hagla and Milka and Tirsa. Now women would be eligible to inherit land under circum circumstances. I wish I had been told this story as a child in Sunday school. I wish I had. Because in this scripture, it's so clear. God's care for women and vulnerable people, those who are overlooked, those the laws of the day are not serving equitably. These women, they knew what they needed to survive. They knew that they deserved more. They knew they were not getting the fair allotment. So they came forward. They took this public stance in their community. They stated what they knew they needed. And God affirms them as righteous. God commands the law to be changed so they could have their needs met. My friends, if we wonder what God wants for pregnant people in our nation, this story gives us so much indication. Our denomination has a hallmark. It's in our book of order. We refer to it a lot. It's God alone is Lord of the conscience. All humans have been given agency. And God's affirmation of these daughters of Zelophehad shows us God's work to change things in accordance with the stated needs of these women. With such a clear pronunciation from God about the five sisters, we might wonder why their story continues to take place in three other scripture texts. And to make a long story short, what we end up discovering is that Moses doesn't quite follow God's pronouncement. In fact, without going a second time to consult he decides to change the pronouncement when some of those five sisters' distant relatives come and complain. If the daughters were to marry outside of their father's tribe, one tribe would get more land than the other. So God, or excuse me, Moses makes God's command conditional, deciding that only if the women marry within their tribe will they be able to receive the inheritance? The book of Numbers closes with these five sisters having to become wives to some of their cousins without any control over their inheritance. And then it's really interesting what happens next. Scripture goes silent on the story of Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tirsa all the way until Joshua chapter 17. And during that silence, what happens is that Moses himself dies and Joshua comes and takes his place as the new leader. And what doesn't happen during that silence is Moses does not ever give to Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tirsa their inheritance. And so by Joshua 17, once again they come now to Joshua and state their demand for their inheritance rights. Now they don't say, Joshua, Moses failed to obey God and died, but the implication is really clear when they say, the Holy One commanded Moses to give us an inheritance along with our male kin. Again, these women don't ask for the land, they simply affirmatively assert their rights. And what's fascinating is this major departure from his predecessor, Moses. Joshua immediately 
gives them the land. The speed of his compliance is in stark contrast with Moses' defiance. It says, and he gave to them according to the mouth of the Holy One an inheritance among the male kin of their father. So what do we make of all of this? God affirmed the righteous demand these women made for greater equity and justice in the law. Moses and other men were resisting it. And despite that clear affirmation from God, the women didn't get the fruits of this new land until much later when this new generational leader, Joshua, takes Moses' place. And Moses, who had disobeyed God, doesn't get to enter the promised land. What about this story is for us? These are these wondering questions that we reflect on together in E3. I wonder what you're thinking. I hear in this story God's call to us and to every church to be willing to leave old traditions behind in order to follow God's justice and compassion in new ways that meet the current needs in front of us and in front of the community. Moses struggled to let go of control and follow the new command of God to bring greater equity to these women. And I know how easy it is to follow in Moses' steps, holding tightly to control, seeking to preserve and protect what we have left when we're called to respond like Joshua did, with efficacy, because God is doing something new. It's very common in church culture to stay static and unchanged, sometimes even raging against the change that is coming to our doors. And I think whether we want to acknowledge them or not, I think there are a whole lot of Malas and Noahs and Haglas and Milkas and Tirsas in our midst whether they're in our church community, our presbytery, our denomination, community members or partners, neighbors around us, I hear them speaking to us. I hear them asking us to pursue issues of justice, whether it's proclaiming a clear message of welcome to our LGBTQIA siblings, or whether it is committing ourselves to the work of anti-racism, or whether it's reconnecting to presbytery siblings seeking the shalom of the city of Trenton, or whether it's the younger generations asking that we stop dismissing them, that we stop dismissing their voices, the way that they use technology, their concerns for the environment, their hopes that institutions would be open to reform and just willing to try things out of the box for once. May we have that humility that we see with Moses to seek the will of God when we're unsure what to do. And may we act with the efficacy of Joshua to realign ourselves and renegotiate our traditions so that we can be obedient to the new things being done by the God of justice and compassion. And may we never forget that the God that we worship affirms as righteous those who step forward and proclaim their need for equity and justice from the system. Amen. We're going to move now into a time of prayer. We'll close that time of prayer with the Lord's Prayer. I'd invite you to quiet your heart and your mind as we come before the God of justice and peace. Holy One, God of healing, God of peace, we thank you for life. We thank you for health for morning and evening, rain and sun, for all that you give us day by day to sustain life. 
Most of all, we thank you, we praise your name for the gift of Jesus, who showed us the way of compassion and justice, the way of your kingdom here on earth. Lord, the news of this week has so many of us anticipating incredible suffering. We anticipate that people are going to become even poorer. We anticipate that this will certainly hurt black people, indigenous people, people of color, more than it will those of us who are white. So what we want to offer you first, O oh Lord, is our laments, our sorrow, the loss and the grief that comes with such a change. Oh Lord, we also want to do what is right, to walk forward in hope as your people, as followers of Jesus, as those whose ancestors are Mala and Hagla and Noah and Milka and Tirsa. Help us, God, to learn the actual things we can do for real people, to manifest your love, to exhibit your realm of love and goodness and peace and joy and justice in the world. We pray this morning for our denomination, for all those ruling elders and teaching elders and young adult advisors who have gathered together in Louisville to do the work and business of the Peace USA. We ask your blessing and grace on the two newly elected co-moderators of the General Assembly, Reverend Ruth Santana Grace and Reverend Siobhan Starling Lewis. We thank you for the bold stance for justice and repair being taken at the General, General Assembly, especially around issues of gun violence and human rights and racism. We ask God that your spirit would stir up in your churches an urge and desire to take prophetic action in ways that promote peace and justice and compassion in the way of Jesus. Help us to not remain on the sidelines. Help us not to give in to apathy or resignation or despair. We pray, God, for our world, our nation, and nearby communities for all those places and communities, families and people struggling under the destructive weight of violence and war. We pray for the people in Ukraine. We pray for the communities in Uvalde and Buffalo. Closer to home, we remember our neighbors, friends in Trenton, in West Philly, Give us hearts of compassion, God. Show us how we could make connections, form relationships of love and humility, rather than give in to the lie of separateness and division. We pray, God, for those in our hearts. We pray for our families, our neighborhoods. We pray for all who are struggling to know the shalom fullness of life you desire for each and every person, for those who are lonely, for those who struggle with addiction, anxiety, low self-esteem. Make them to know their belovedness. We pray for those out of work, struggling to make ends meet, those without safe and secure housing, those who are hungry. Show us where we can help provide for those fundamental and basic needs. Give us hearts of generosity and compassion. Be Jehovah Jireh, God the provider, for all who do not have their basic human needs met. We pray, God, for bodies and spirits to be healed, for those who are tired, in pain, awaiting surgery, struggling with physical therapies for those awaiting death. Hear us as we pray by name aloud and silently. We lift before you now Marilyn and Barb, Tony, Joan, 
Sandy, Wendy, Edna, Tom, Claire, Pam and Dan, Jean and Ellie, Ruth, Peg, Kathy, Richard, Joyce. God, we pray a special blessing on the children in our communities and neighborhoods for their play this summertime, which is their work to do right now. May they be strengthened and renewed before starting a new school year. We pray for an ever-increasing opening of their minds, new ways of seeing, new understandings of the gifts you call them to use in the world. We pray for their safety and health. We take these requests and all those that have remained unnamed, and we lift them before you now, and we join our voices praying together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as part of our time for the offering this morning, I want to invite you, if you feel so led, to use today's paper circle, which hopefully you got when you walked in with your bulletin, to write down the name of a person or a group or a movement or an issue, something that you feel called to pay more attention to because you know that God is a God of justice and compassion who calls us to listen to those who cry for justice and equity. As you write that down, whatever that is for you, I would invite you to commit to doing more than prayer. Commit to learning more. Commit to some kind of action. Opal Lee, who we learned last week is the grandmother of Juneteenth, she reminded us all that none of us are free until all of us are free, and we aren't free yet. So I invite you to take a moment. We'll give a pause here before we call for our regular offering. Just as the Lord instructed Moses to give property to those daughters of Zelophehad to maintain justice in the midst of a new situation, we are being invited to bring our gifts of time and talent and treasures to God that they might be used for new things that God wants to do in our community and in our world. We thank you for your generosity in giving. We have a plate where you can put not only your circle, but your pledges and offerings as you leave. For those of you who are worshiping online, we have a website with a Donate Now but button at the very bottom as you scroll down on our website on our home page. I'd invite you to join your voices with me as we dedicate all of these offerings to God. Take these gifts, O oh God, for the work of this church. Let them stand as signs of your love and faithfulness in the name of the one who shows us a new way of love and justice, we pray. Amen. Please stand. This is in the midst of new dimensions. It's in Sing the Faith, but I've also given you the words so you can take them this week and continue to reflect on them, and they'll be on our screen.
Amen. Receive the benediction. Our ancestors, Hagla, Noah, Milka, Tirza, and Mala. They show us the way to come and stand, to make our needs known, to stand for justice. They show us the way to listen to those who come anew to stand. May God give us the courage to stand and the humility to listen. May we go with the God who says what they said is righteous. May this be a blessing to you this week. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, amen.